Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Martin Spring uh, from Lancaster University Management School. And um, as, as chair of the conference, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, if, you if I haven't seen you before, as it were, in one of these sessions, uh, welcome you to the, the conference uh, hosted at Lancaster University. As you know, the uh, one of the th big themes of the conference is the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, um, what happens next. And as such, um, we're delighted to welcome uh, as the keynote speaker for today, uh, Dr. David Nabarro from uh, the World Health Organization and his colleague, John Atkinson. Um, David is um, the, uh, the World Health Organization Special Envoy on COVID-19 um, and is Strategic uh, Director of the Social Enterprise 4SD, uh, Skills, Systems and Synergies for Sustainable Development, which encompasses uh, COVID and, and other er areas of activity. Um, uh, he also holds a chair in the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College, where he's co-director of global health at the Institute of Global Health Innovation. Um, John, John Atkinson uh, has held a number of uh, senior consultancy roles and uh, currently advises on systems leadership, which is going to be a big theme of the, the uh, keynote today. Uh, and he, he works with uh, David in, in 4SD, the, the uh, social enterprise that I mentioned. Um, the keynote will take the form essentially of a conversation between John and David um, on, on the topic of COVID and, and I'm sure other things uh, related to and beyond that based on their various experiences uh, over, over many years. Um, it reminds me just to say, uh, as, as usual, please post any questions on the uh, Q&A uh, box on, on the right of your screen. Um, and I'd like to just mention that BAM is grateful to the Association for project management for, for sponsoring this particular session. Um, uh, we're looking forward to uh, a, a, a topical, exciting and interesting uh, discussion. Uh, over to you, John and David. Martin, thank you. Thank you ever so much for, for the introduction and, and the, you know, the very generous comments. Um, we're really looking forward to this. We've been thinking a lot about what we might bring in terms of uh, a, a, a dialogue really about leadership and how it's impacted through COVID, and the very particular take that we've take, uh, you know, explored throughout, and how that's contributed to the positions that we've taken and the, the lines that we've explored. Um, so we'll do this as a conversation between David and I to begin with, uh, first exploring the experience of COVID and the nature of the problem and where we are at, th at this point in time, probably 18 months in. We'll then introduce some thoughts around living systems leadership, some of the thinking that, that's influenced our choices and our decisions and the way that we've looked at, at the problem. And then we'll look forward and say, well, so what is it that leaders are going to need to, to, to contribute if, if, uh, if we're going to take this forward in a helpful and sensible way? So that's how, how we'd like it to work. Um, we'd like it to shift partway through from a conversation between David and I to a conversation that encompasses all of us, that enables you to join in. And so to that end, through the, through the conference platform, please start posting your questions, your observations, your comments at, at any point as they go. And then you know, as, as we transition into that element of it, Martin will, will bring those out and we'll start to share them with David and I. And we'll use that to develop the conversation as we go further and hopefully take it in a way that reflects the interests that you have in it. So that's a little bit of intro. Don't forget to keep you know, making your comments as we go because it'll make it much easier to, for us to transition on. And now really over to you, David, perhaps a little bit about the role, but more particularly also, what about COVID? Um, what, how, does, how does COVID actually spread, proliferate, cause, cause the issues that it causes? And where does that leave us now as we've started to learn a lot more about it over time? Over to you. Thanks, John, and great to be with everybody. Martin, uh, you've really reached out and encouraged us to be here, and we're delighted. We're also realizing that we are truly uh, amateurs in your area of specialism, particularly me. I'm a public health doctor. I've been working in public health for 45 years uh, around the world. I've also been involved in food. And then more recently, I've been working in the United Nations on trying to coordinate and then advance on really complex challenges right across the spectrum within the context of something called 
the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. That's the plan for the future of the world and her people that was agreed by world leaders after two and a half years of preparation in September 2015. It's the only plan we've got. And given that we've only got one world, I think it's quite important that we pay attention to it. It has 17 goals, 169 targets, but most importantly, it stresses that people who are experiencing tough times and difficulty in one area, for example, in health or in education or shelter or the impact of climate change, tend to be the same people. That if you're suffering on one of these areas, you tend to suffer on others. And therefore, all the time separating people's lives into separate slices or pieces, whilst it might suit those of us who are involved in providing services, doesn't necessarily reflect the interests of people uh, who are affected by the challenges around in today's world. And so I've been involved in all that as an international bureaucrat, as well as as a professional. And because I've done a fair amount of work on disease prevention and on outbreaks, uh, I've been involved in uh, influenza pandemics and in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And then early in 2020, I was invited by the World Health Organization to be a special envoy on COVID. Let me just, John, share some of the points about COVID briefly. And please do, if you feel that I've gone off track, just use the usual techniques to pull me back. So this is a new virus. It's a coronavirus. It's got the long name of SARS, NCOV2, and it's a virus that really has appeared new uh, when it's come to our collective knowledge at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. And the, the core question when we first knew about it at the end of January, and it, it, I was, for me it was the end of January 2020, was uh, how is this virus transmitted and what's its impact? And there were uncertainties at the beginning, whether it was readily transmitted between people, but pretty quickly by uh, the middle to end of January 2020, we knew the following. One, that it's quite a nasty virus. Two, that it is carried in droplets that people produce when they cough or sneeze. And those droplets usually don't go much further than about a metre out of people's mouths. Thirdly, uh, that you could actually stop the disease from spreading by identifying people with it and then isolating them and then finding those with whom they've been in contact and isolating them as well. This is the time-honoured technique for dealing with infectious diseases that we've used uh, over the years, and it applies for this one as well. But uh, the last point about it is that we know that coronaviruses are remarkably stable and at the same time have a habit of mutating. They don't tend to just disappear like some other viruses, and when they mutate, they're quite difficult to, to manage. And so we were preparing even early last year for the possibility that there would be variants that would come and trouble us. So John, here we had it, a new virus transmitted easily in droplets, quite unpleasant, and particularly at the beginning, uh, but targeting older people and people with other diseases and killing them. And then at the same time, a, a, a disease that, as far as we could tell then, could be prevented by uh, identifying people and isolating them, but really early on. And um, there we were, and it was January end. How do you prepare a world for something like this? How do you help people to get on top of it? And the big challenge that I experienced early on was this, do you just go into emergency mode and you say, well, in each country you identify one person who's the senior advisor uh, advising the person in charge, the prime minister or the president, and you go for unitary command and control of assets because it's an emergency. Or because this impacts on people in so many different ways, 
Do you need to go for a more collective system of organization and actually in find ways to engage large numbers of different people? How then do you cope with the problems of direction? How do you cope with the problems of actually getting people to follow the line uh, if you're going to go for this broader system of organization? And we were really, I think, in some difficulty, particularly in February, March last year, as to whether this should be done as a standard emergency response or whether it needed a broader, more plural, more, more participatory response. And perhaps we could spend some time, John, talking about that because uh, we've both been invested in this uh, for the last uh, 18 months, really. So I think what we did see, David, was, was in a number of places, the emergency response was where people went. Um, they went, no, we need to grab this. We need, we need to get control. We need to be seen to be in control. We'll, we'll position this as a fight that we have to win. And a lot of militaristic language appears about um, fighting the virus, uh, gaining, gaining ground, all, all of that sort of stuff. And a lot of a sense of there has to be a centralized message, there has to be an answer. And it put people into quite a, a binary situation. Are you winning? Are you not? What's the number? Is it this? Is it, is it, is it not? Um, and it led us into a space where, which, which was slightly at odds with all of that. In the, the, you know, one of the messages, David, that we kept coming back to was more people doing more of the right things for more of the time because they choose to. Now, that's a leadership response, not a, um, not a directive response. If people are choosing to do these things, then why would, that, why would they do that? How do they make sense of the environment? And one of the points we, we, we got to in all of this was, was a, I think, a recognition, in, certainly in some countries, that emergency responses, although necessary at the outset, perhaps, although doing certain things, weren't sufficient for dealing with the virus, once we started to see spikes that led to surges um, and, all, and all of the sort of stuff that we've seen. So people needed to transition into different sorts of approaches. And some of the things that we saw were quite interesting. I don't know if you would you know, want, to, want to explore some of the, the, the nature of the various levels that needed, needed response and how that started to come about. Thanks, John. So absolutely. Um, uh, here was the, the starting conundrum again early last year. When you're dealing with this particular kind of virus, do you need to take rapid and robust action quickly in order to get ahead of it? Or can you take a more proportionate response and accompany the emergence of, of outbreak spikes uh, as they appear and deal with them in real time. Uh, there were some who said, you really do have to act early. The last thing you want is a lot of this virus getting into your communities and basically getting stuck there so that over time there can be new outbreaks occurring, and new spikes and surges of disease. If you've got a situation where there is a constant threat of the disease emerging, you are never really on top of it. You're always fighting a rearguard action. Whereas if you can get in early, then you can prevent it spreading and you are really ahead of the virus. As a public health doctor, John, I was really keen on this getting in quickly and early, preparing for the virus to arrive, and then putting into place defensive mechanisms, in particular systems for detecting and then isolating, tracing contacts and isolating those. To do that, it would be necessary to have widespread testing capability and locally organized, integrated ways of getting communities engaged in the response. Now, I think that there was a lot of interest in this, what we call public health response. But you know, John, what we sensed governments wanted to move into quite quickly was the use of restrictions on people and on populations as the primary means of control. 
using emergency powers sometimes to basically be able to stop people moving in areas of high disease concentration and to use restrictions on movement as the primary control method. I kind of, I want to put to you, John, and to colleagues here, that that use of restriction as the basic control method early on, often supported by emergency powers, had one long-standing disadvantage. You're restricting people Yet people are the primary asset that you have in dealing with the virus. Now, if we want people to be partners in the response, to be the solution rather than the problem, then we have to move towards a point where their in, in working on the response is not seen as something that's done uh, with fines or other in, uh, disincentives to guide them, but is instead done as a partnership and that we're actually working together, different sections of society to get on top of the virus. That the response is characterized by trust between state and people rather than suspicion. And we were suggesting that this partnership approach backed by a systems uh, style of management would be more likely to have long-term success than one which is based on restriction and regulation. And then as we looked around the world, we saw that uh, yes, governments that do not have the capacity to enforce various behaviors on their people will perhaps in the longer term be better able to deal with the issue because almost uh, uh, by necessity, uh, they will not be able to use the military or the police or other bodies or the law and courts in order to try to regulate behavior. Instead, they have to do it through partnership. Now, uh, I, I mean, there are many other facets, but I want to use that as one of my first building blocks with you on what's needed is people are the solution, partnership approaches are absolutely necessary, and that's the desired direction. I've got a couple more, but I wanted to lay that one out first. That's really interesting, David, because I think where that took us at that point was a conversation about power. And how much power do you actually have to do this? If you're relying on a centralized um, form of, of control in order to, to get things to happen, you are, take, you are in effect trying to remove power from individuals to make their own choices. And if you see people as the solution and not as the problem, then removing that power from them over their own action becomes a difficult thing. And so long as you can maintain that centralized form of, of, of control, then fine, you get to a certain point, but at some point you have to release. And at that point, if what you've been relying on is, is coercion in effect to keep, to keep um, the situation under control, there's a real risk that things proliferate quite 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 significantly so we were looking through this as to how do we create messages how do we create a narrative how do we create a story that enables people to make sense of the situation more effectively for themselves uh, how do you allow people to um, determine what's the right thing for me to do in every circumstance that I'm in based on a reasonable assessment of risk and risk and we found this pretty hard because people generally find understanding an exponential threat very, very difficult. The, the, you know, however much we try and describe the effect of the doubling over time, it really, really takes off. But the other element that we found uh, about this is that when you centralise control, you lose that diversity of response and of understanding that enables you to determine the adaptations that are necessary to take place. So testing and reporting on test numbers, for example, at a national level misses the diversity of what's happening in places. It misses who's, who's being tested and who's not. It misses where is the disease. And when you started to talk to people at leading the situation at local level, they knew very accurately once the numbers had got lower, 
where the, where the spikes and surges were taking place. They knew that they were taking place in certain forms of employment, in certain forms of education, in certain forms of, of, of perhaps of worship. There are all sorts of very distinct things happening, which if you plot it at a very micro level, you can respond to quite adaptively. But if you try to make sense of it through a centralized process, it all disappears into the, into the overall trend of the data. Does that make yeah, sense, I, David? Is it? Yeah. yeah, I just, I really wanted to agree with you on that. And so, the other two points that I wanted to, to put on the, on the table between us that I think have been uh, issues that we've had to navigate are firstly, uncertainty about risk. And, and you mentioned that, and I want to build on that. And the second one is the local adaptation that draws on diversity as a resource. And let me start about uncertainty about risk. One of the challenges about this virus is that certainly I, as a public health person, really don't understand enough about it to be able to predict to anybody what it's going to do. And you might say, what do you mean? I mean, it's pretty obvious. This is a virus that likes to spread. This is a virus that can cause disease. This is a virus that mutates. And yes, at that very basic level, there are many things that I think all people involved in public health are agreed on. But can I tell you what's going to happen in terms of patterns of incidents and their consequences for health in different parts of the United Kingdom in September to December this year? i.e. the next four months? I can't really tell you with any sense of certainty what this virus is going to do. And so uh, um, in order to, to, make, to, make, to, to, to make predictions and to offer advice to governments, we need to be able to give some degree of certainty on what is likely to happen in the coming weeks and months. Otherwise, it's incredibly hard for them to be able to decide how they want to use resources. It's very hard for businesses to decide what they're going to do to maintain continuity. And it's super hard for institutions like schools and universities to plan the months ahead. So what we have to do is to establish scenarios for the future, which have some basis in terms of our experience and our understanding, but also which are put together with the necessary humility uh, to indicate that when it comes to assessing risk, we've got many holes. And you see, because of this very localized behavior of this virus and the disease, Things like national models based on national figures for R0, the number of people that one person infects over time, uh, are only partially useful. We know how this virus can behave if it's left to its own devices. It's incredibly transmissible, and many of the new variants are even more transmissible than the original. And we also know that under certain circumstances, it can cause incredible disease, but we find more and more out about it because of long COVID and similar problems. So in summary, we have gaps in our understanding of risk, which make it very hard for us to be able to actually predict what might happen under different control scenarios. That's my issue number one. It doesn't mean that experts have no utility, but it does mean that experts have to be honest, I believe, about the limitations of their ability to look into crystal balls and say where it's going to go. The second point, which is really building on what you just said, John, is because the little surges that we see with this disease tend to be incredibly local. In the UK recently, Newquay in Cornwall was identified as 
one of the places where there was the highest incidence in the whole of the UK. But it was only Newquay. And, and now why, why is this? Answer, because most of the spread is super local through droplets. And that does mean that you, you need to get used to the fact that it can crop up anywhere with a very sharp surge and you can miss it if, if, you're, if you're not looking with a great deal of granularity. But at the same time, if it's cropping up locally, you can work with local organisations who are in touch with people and, and get their help in dealing with it. Because as you said, John, in, in trying to stop the spread of the disease, you've got to have cooperation. It's got to be a joint activity between people and authorities. So the second part of it is just to, to say for everybody, the only way we can deal with this is groups working together in an integrated and well-organized way at the local level, in the local authority, in the local community, with the local organizations, with support from the center, of course, but with local decision-making using KPIs that everybody is comfortable with. And that's where the control comes from, from that local capability. So those were the things I wanted to say that for, for me mean that we need to be able to combine emergency operations and perhaps slower, more systems based ways of working at the same time, because this can crop up any time and there will be occasions when we do need to move quickly. Secondly, we need to be still comfortable about the fact that there's a lot we don't know. But we're not scared of saying it and we're open with people, our partners in the response, that sometimes we have to shift strategy because new information appears and that's okay. It's not you turning, it's adapting. And thirdly, that we have to work locally. We, and because the, the outbreaks come up locally and the responses have to be local, integrated local response capabilities supported nationally and internationally is key and i believe that that gives us the basis for responding as effectively as we possibly can back to you john so that's fascinating david and it where it where it takes me and you know it, from from my perspective looking at it through through the leadership lens is what we're trying to create is an enduring capacity for adaptation and that throws up a tension between control and liberation. How much do we allow people to be free? How much do we, do we decide that there are, there are certain norms that must follow? But what, what we're trying to create is an emerge or encourage, because it can't actually be created, is the emergence in the, in the, in the biological sense of a new way of operating, both locally, both nationally, both internationally. And we know the conditions that are necessary for that to happen. And leaders can make quite a direct um, impact on that. We know there needs to be sufficient energy for people to want to do something differently. And part of the act of leadership is finding that and connecting that and amplifying that, that where we find people in one place doing something really interesting, it may be different to another, but because they've been able to do it, it's really valuable for them to transfer it to their, to their peers. The other thing that's really valuable is dissonance. It's being able to, to, to manage and hold the different points of view. However much we may be antagonized or angry at some of the points of view that we hold, we have to respect that that's where people are coming from. And we have to be able to hold that difference together sufficiently long that, a, that an appropriate and a, and a new form of working emerges out of it. So the leadership task is, is holding that space and that means paying a constant attention to, to the various interests, to where are they coming from, to why are they coming from, and not being dismissive, uh, not being accepting at the same time. It's holding almost quite a neutral space that says, well, this is the group of people we've got to deal with and how are we going to make this work? But then it's about creating this, this capacity for rapid amplification. And that comes from how we connect people. And one of the things that, that we found looking at responses in various parts of the world is it's the places where it connects, where different levels connect, where different organizations connect, that we're able to very rapidly 
uh, adapt responses to the situation that's emerging. So where public health uh, leaders are connected to city leaders, are connected to business leaders, are connected to faith leaders, are connected to sports leaders, we're able to create almost this one city, this one country, this one place message that enables people to say, ah, oh, well, I'm a part of that. My identity is a part of my place more than just what do I want to do? Do I find wearing a mask irritating? Yes, I do, so I won't. But, but do, do I find that I'm looking after my place it takes on a different sense. So building this enduring capacity for adaptation seems to be a critical role of, of leaders through this. And seeing the world, therefore, as alive, as an ecosystem, uh, with all its diversity, with all its complexity, uh, with the, the very necessary elements of symbiosis that, that all of us exist in relationship to others, uh, it seems really, really important in, in making any decisions work. David, we're sort of at the point where it might be good to, to, to hand over and bring in some of um, the comments from, from outside, you know, from the floor. Uh, is there any closing remarks that you'd want to make that, that sort of bring it together from your point of view or things that, that you haven't covered that you, you, you thought would be good to, to just get across? Thanks so much, uh, John. If uncertainty about risk is a, uh, a challenging aspect of getting groups of people to work together on the response, and if the, the ideal way to deal with things is through greater local level organization, which puts partnering with people at the center, then I'd like to say that we do need to work hard, John, on the narrative, the, the thread that actually holds together everything that we as individuals, as societies, and as nations are doing. And perhaps the priority for every single one of us, like particularly people like myself, who are expected to provide guidance, is that our narrative has to be really as clear as we can possibly make it. Honestly indicating where we're stuck, for example, on which new variants will emerge or whether the vaccines will protect against them, but also honestly indicating where we think we've got a, a strong point to make. So my, my concluding remark at this point would be a narrative isn't good enough yet. And I think we'll see when we go to some, at least one of the questions that I've already seen in the chat, that a priority has to be to keep working on that narrative not least so that everybody everywhere who's asked to change the way in which they live because of the threats posed by this virus has some sense in their heart as to why they're being asked to do it. So that it doesn't come across as capricious instructions from a distant state to something that I'm being asked to do because I am part of a response. So getting that narrative into place Testing it and validating it is a bit my current priority, John. That's excellent. And for me, the thing I take from it is connectedness. The thing that we've seen that seems to make most difference in one is allowing such a narrative to become established and understood and people to make their own sense of it is the quality of connections between local populations and their local agencies, between local agencies and regional agencies, regional and national and national and international. And there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done there. If there's a leadership challenge around narrative, there's a leadership challenge around connection too, because that's the thing that allows a common sense to emerge. And from that, a sense of integrated action that, that will, will help us get to the state that you've been talking about, David, so often. This, this being able to live with COVID as it, in our presence and to be able to adapt to it rapidly as we need to. So that's a, a sort of prompt really martin to, to think you know this is a very real problem this is a very big problem um it, it's an evolving problem it's full of risk it's full of uncertainty there's all sorts of things that we might do about it and it, you know i'm wondering if now feels a good time to open that up through you uh, to some of the things that, that have been going on in, in the chat and some of the questions that might be arising so martin what's been coming in thank you very much john david um 
it's good to see you remaining so calm under under the pressure that you must have been under at these last 18 months, I must say. Um, so we, yes, we have a number, number of questions focusing on, on management aspects. Um, let me put the first one to you. Um, and this is from uh, Katie Mason, um, who says, based on your experience, where do you think the critical points are where work and business life collide with public health? And what could we do in the business and management research community to put the world of work and business on the front foot next time. David, do you want to go? Because I'm quite happy to, to, to pitch in on that one first. And, and um... you start. Okay, so one of the things I would I would say, we we looked quite closely at where, where are these spikes of infection happening and why? Um, and the place that we got to often was it's determined by, by terms and conditions of employment. Where people are working in warehousing, in meat packaging, in all sorts of environments where people are on zero hours contracts, they're on very low salaries, they have no security of employment. The things that we would ask them to do in terms of isolating, in terms of the, things, the normal things that break chains of transmission, they, they absolutely couldn't do. The level of um, state assistance, uh, it was probably too low to, to catch them. So if they if they think they've got if you think you've got a, 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 a an infection, you go well. Let's hope it's only a cold because it won't affect my work. Two or three days later, you're thinking um, uh, this is a bit nastier than I thought. But um, you can't really um, you know afford to take the time off. And you know by the time we worked through that process, that the, the journey that people in in very um, you know, marginal bits of the economy were were, were taking. We found, you know, it's 10, 12 days before the, 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 the process of finding them and helping them was getting to them, by which time they've infected, you know, all their family, all their peers, all the people that they're traveling to work in the same car as. So, so the terms and conditions of employment make a fundamental difference to the proliferation of the disease. So have a, have a think, how do I employ my people? How do I, you know, what, what are the unintended consequences of the thing, of the actions that I've been taken on their social interaction? Uh, and does that help or hinder the spread? I agree with that. I think business uh, truly, and the world of work specifically, uh, should lead and uh, could do more to lead. Number two, if, if business is going to lead, remember one thing. This COVID is a disease of poverty, disadvantage and inequity. And so to John's point, uh, if poorer people are going to be enabled to do their best to prevent the spread, then they have to have agency. Uh, and we have seen time and time again that the lowest paid staff in a lot of enterprises are often not in a good space to be able to exercise that agency. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate when we hear that in their employment settings, uh, that opportunity for some reason is denied them. And we've been able to meet with employers who have been absolutely amazing at engaging with their staff early on to work out how best to reduce the risks, for example, on the floor of meat processing factories or within the crew uh, quarters of, of both um, defence vessels and cruise liners. And, and what we've learned is you just have to listen to the people. It, it just doesn't work if, if you make decisions on their account or on their behalf, assuming that you understand the challenges they face in avoiding infection and worse. So agreeing, uh, totally agreeing with John and totally wanting to stress uh, that at all times we should take account of just this basic truth that is that COVID is a disease of poverty, disadvantage and inequity. And by the way, John, just thinking about narratives, the other thing I'm saying to everybody is this virus is not scheduled to go away anytime soon. It's here and it's likely to stick with humanity for years. And that means that we have to be building into our thinking and our action uh, strategies for long-term 
living with COVID as a constant threat. Back to you, John. I suppose the other, the other thing that we were saying quite early on, David, is that the business can be really active in making their places comfortable for, for, for staff. In, you know, how are we making it easy to test the self-test if you want to? How are we making it easy to check that I'm okay? That, it, that, it, that rather than feel anxious about being in work because I feel like I'm being constrained into an office environment or a, or a production environment that, 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 doesn't, that, that makes me feel unsure and uncertain, how can I work with my employees to create an environment where they think, no, this is a safe place, this is a good place, and I feel valued? Because the, the benefits of that will be much greater than COVID. So there's a bit of extra on that about the place being safe. Imagine you have a team of 60 people, and including in that team are people who are relatively low paid, perhaps on part-time jobs, perhaps cleaning or other such things. Imagine one of those cleaners has a disabled child at home who's immune deficient. And uh, the uh, person concerned is extremely anxious about risk uh, to her child. It's super important that at all stages, the employer is listening ideally the chief executive is listening and um, 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 methods are found to make sure that the needs of individuals with their own circumstances are heard and in no way dismissed that in my view is the difference between a caring and partnering employer and one who is not i go one step further on this it may well be in your in your workforce that 15 percent of people do not want to get vaccinated i would be really really cautious before requiring people to get vaccinated and to have proof of vaccination as part of the employment contract really careful the people who've decided not to get vaccinated have got very good and clear reasons for doing so and they've thought about it incredibly hard. Uh, the last thing they want is to be treated in a way that implies there's something wrong with their behaviour. Uh, the only consequence of that is it will probably harden their resolve to avoid. And, and what we're beginning to see around the world is a split into those who are vaccinated and those who are not. And part of that is unavoidable because of people in poor countries who just can't get vaccine. And so they are unable to travel and access and all that stuff. But there's also people who've decided not to get vaccinated for, for reasons of belief. And my advice for now is please do not create a situation where there is discrimination against those who are not being vaccinated. Back to you, John. Martin, let's 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 pick another thread out. Thank you. Yes, we'll do. Moving from perhaps the world of work to a more political sphere, uh, and back to some of your earlier points about um, trust uh, trust in the community. Um, so, uh, Jan Bevington from uh, Lancaster University and the, the Pentland Centre. Um, and I think this question may have got a bit truncated, but I think I, get, I know what, what the question is. To what extent do you believe that the pre-existing lack of trust in the competence and integrity of the UK government compared to New Zealand and the team of five million, um, and I think Jan might have mean, um, af af affected the approach uh, and the way it played out in the UK? Um, Jan, I'll perhaps correct me if I'm wrong in the way I've uh, finished the question for her. <laughs> David, do you want to start on this one? Thanks. All I'm going to say is that from my perspective, responses to infectious diseases really only work if they're built on a trust between the people involved in the response and those who are directing it. When I was working in Liberia in 2014, I had a very difficult meeting with the president on one occasion when we were experiencing very high levels of suffering and death due to Ebola virus disease. And 
the, the president said to me, it feels as though the whole of the world has forgotten us. Our normal allies have deserted us. Nobody seems to be caring what happens in our little country. We feel alone. And it, it was interesting just how profound the sense of being deserted was and how much uh, the, the president was seeking help. And she was very grateful that uh, my boss, the United Nations Secretary General, had appointed me as his envoy for Ebola. And I think she was relieved that I came along and said, we, the United Nations, are going to do everything we can to support Liberia and your neighbours through this tragic situation. About a week later, I went back to office. She was smiled. She met me with great respect. And it was a completely different meeting. And I said, great to see you. So up. Uh, Madam, what's going on? She said, I've just had a phone call from the President of the United States. And do you know what was great about this phone call? He said, we are not, uh, we have not forgotten you. And suddenly we felt a huge shift in not just my own feeling, but the feeling of our cabinet. And then we were able to go on to radio and television and tell the people that US had not forgotten them. Uh, shortly afterwards, I, I went with her to Parliament and we were starting to hear senators from around the country picking up on this energy from the US president and just all coming together and saying, we're going to get our communities in our counties taking action themselves to reduce the risk of this disease. We're going to change the way in which we bury people when they've died of Ebola. We're going to change the way in which we care for them. And we are going ourselves to make our counties Ebola free counties and bit by bit the counties did it. But it all came from this sense of the United States president contacting the president of Liberia and saying, we've not forgotten you. We're with you. We care for you. We want to work as part of the battle. And then the same message conveyed on to the senators and the same message conveyed on in the communities. What does it mean, John? It means, in our experience, the only way you do this is with people on side. And that has to be built in as early as possible. We would have had a much worse situation with Ebola if we had not managed to get people on side. And people on side is about leaders leveling with the people saying, I'm with you. I'm not again you. I hope that is, uh, makes sense. It's my personal view. Uh, and I think that it's also increasing the view of the World Health Organization and others. We can't do these unless we work together. I, th I think if I go back to Jan's question, David, the thing I take from it is New Zealand isn't the UK. And so lead, you might wish that you got a response that was similar to Taiwan or Singapore or Vietnam in the early, you know, in the early stages. But you have to work with the environment you're in <clears throat> and that's the the symbiotic nature of so sort of the, the living system stuff you can't just say in abstract well what's a good response to this and we may be able to say a good response has these characteristics but how do you do them here and that goes again back to the point we were making about connectedness how do you really understand what's going on because understanding what's going on comes at one level from the data how many people are being infected how many people are ending in hospital how many people are on, are on um are, are in um, support life support or uh, how many people are dying all these sorts of stuff but that doesn't tell you enough about what people are likely to do or prepared to do or able to do in order that you can gauge your response to them and I think one of the, the things that I would think of in terms of, of, of Jan's question is to build that trust, you have to be in relationship with people of, of certain sorts. And when something like COVID arrives or arises, you have the existing relationship in place and you have to understand what that is and adapt to it and work very quickly with it and not develop a response that's created in abstract that says, well, this is the right thing to do and I'll do that and everyone will just come with me. Because if you, as you've said, David, you have to work with people in order to make it work and you therefore need to know what's the likelihood that they're going to actually engage with you in the way that you might hope, as opposed to the likelihood that they do exactly the opposite just because they're not in that, in that sense of, uh, of relationship with you. Martin. Thank you. Yeah. This is a, 
a short question, which probably uh, and which asks for a fairly short answer. Um, Madeline Barrows, what is the single key message that should be printed in big letters and placed in front of our leaders next time we have a major crisis? <laughs> well, David, I'll let you. I'll let you go first again. Uh, if you want me to pitch in, I'm happy to because I, I, I. Well, I'll I'll go and then give it back to you. I would say learn. Just one word, learn. Learn really, really, really quickly. Connect to your environment. Understand what's happening in it. Test it. Go out. You know, trial things very, very quickly, uh, because and it's a novel. In any novel situation, we've got the, the description that David described of just not knowing enough about what the risk is, what's going on, what's happening. So, rather than get into tell mode, get into learn mode really, really, really quickly. And you have to learn faster than the things evolving around you. David, you may see it differently. I don't know. No, I love that. Uh, for me, it's people are, are the partners in any crisis response. Uh, and I would have that all over the place. Um, and if somebody said to me, well, what do you really mean by it? What do you really mean by that? Uh, I would say, oops, echo. What do you really mean by that? I would say, please do uh, everything you can not to somehow imply that participation in the response is a political act. Because viruses don't vote. And the way in which people vote should not have any impact at all on the extent to which they are empowered to get on top of a disease threat. Uh, there are various other things that should not have any impact either. But I just want to be absolutely straight with you, John. Uh, I, I'm not at all clear in my own mind uh, how best to stop what appears to be the party politics coming into pandemic response, uh, because it's not a party political issue. Thanks, Martin. And your point about learn makes me, well, it makes me think of something I heard Greg Clark um, in his capacity as uh, chair of the Science, Science and uh, um, Select Committee pointing out that we were doing, um, you know, tr trialing vaccines on the hoof and, and that was about use it and then learn, learn rather than waiting for the peer reviewed journal papers to come out and so on. So there's that sense of learning on the fly um, seem, seems to become it's something that's been um, talked about more and more in product development and industry. And it seems to be part of part of the approach to this. And that links, I think, I'll take the liberty of linking it to a question from Feng Li, um, who says, thank you for sharing your insights on the leadership lessons uh, from responding to COVID. I might be oversimplifying this, but most of the lessons I'm hearing are responsive or reactive rather than proactive to an emergency that is unfolding in front of us at a very rapid pace. Are such approaches sufficient or even effective in addressing most of the UN sustainable development goals, particularly environmental challenges and uneven development? So uh, maybe that's connected to your uh, learn um, uh, uh, um, point, John. Do we have to be reactive and responsive or is there more? Well, I think one of the things that, that I was saying when we were talking about leaders working with emergence, how you how a new state arises that, that, that shapes everything that goes within it, the emergence of a world that can live with COVID, the emergence of a world that can cope, that, 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 that isn't overheating, that, that can cope with environmental uh, presences. One, you can't control that as a leader, but that doesn't mean that you can't be proactive. And the thing that gives you the, the insight, really, into, into how to do that is, is spotting the, the amplification loops, is spotting where uh, things are rapidly shifting and are connecting increasingly rapidly with, with other parts of the environment. So that gives you almost a sense of foresight um, and points you at how you might act and might, um, therefore, take steps that, that seem to be in the right direction. But then, you know, David's described a situation where he's saying, look, here we are, three to four months to get forward. I can't tell you what the pattern will be. And, you, you know, 
that's somebody who's very, very knowledgeable on the, on the situation. So we need to, to be mindful of what we can know and control and what we can't. And we need to take action where we can and, and not where we can't. And we need to make some good guesses, some educated guesses. And that's why we keep going back to this process of rapidly adapting uh, responses where you're forever probing into, not randomly necessarily, you have a sense of direction with it. You have a sense of intent as to what you want to do. Uh, and that's where your proactive element comes. But you've still got to learn very, very quickly as to what's really going to work in this and what doesn't. Because the correct disease response that David described, pretty well known. How do you do it in a country like the UK? How do you do it in a country like France? How do you do it in a country like Namibia? How do you do it in a country like Tanzania? How do you do it in Brazil, in Hungary, in all, all these sorts of places? is going to vary quite dramatically. Uh, and that's why the learning piece needs to be matched to this sense of intent and direction. David. The one thing that I tried to do when I was responsible for pandemic preparedness uh, in the United Nations uh, in about 2006 to 10 was to get groups who in normal practice perhaps do not spend a lot of time working together to get into the habit of working together so that when the necessity to form new ways of cross-stakeholder or cross-sectoral working, they were able to do so. Everything from having the telephone numbers of the people you need to convene in a WhatsApp group so that when you need to use it, it's set up, through to having standing capacity where you meet in what we would call peacetime in order to be prepared to go into the response mode when the time comes. Now, people used to say to me, why do you fuss with such apparently trivial details? And I said, in the crises in which I've worked, you can spend two or three days at the beginning hunting for numbers or hunting for the right person to get to a meeting if you haven't practiced it in advance. You won't always get it right but at least you will have done some of the preparatory work. You will have the acronyms for the different arrangements already uh, identified. You will have done some practice and simulation. Uh, and, and provided the simulation is more about how we work rather than what we're going to do, uh, I believe it's useful. So in summary, uh, get the systems tested uh, during peacetime because you will need them sometimes in quite a hurry uh, when the problem starts. And honestly, inventing new ways of working when you're dealing with a, 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 an, an acute situation uh, is awfully time consuming and super frustrating. That's me. Martin, we're into the last two minutes, I think. Yes, rather than uh, squeeze another question in inelegantly, I think I'll perhaps call a halt there. Um, uh, there, there are lots more questions than we have time to handle. Um, and particularly sorry to Greg Bamber, who's come a long way from Melbourne to, to pose a question. And um, perhaps, perhaps uh, John and David can um, provide provide some written comments on some of these uh, other questions that we haven't had time to to, to uh, address here and now. Um, let me um, in, instead thank you both very much for uh, a fascinating tour de raison or raison uh, in in uh, respect to COVID and and other. Um, uh, issues you've been working with. Um, it, it's, uh, we know you're extremely busy, um, David and John, so we're ever so grateful for you to give, give time to, for, to the, the British Academy of Management uh, Conference. Um, lots to think about, lots of management issues uh, and leadership uh, issues that, that you've raised um, and, and plenty for us to do. There have been a, a lot of special issues of journals uh, around in the last uh, a few months, but I think there's, there's still plenty more to, to think about as we spend more time reflecting and, and learning through uh, what, what we've all been living with and living through. So um, this is where we would like to have a room full of people who can provide um, a round of applause <laughs> and thank you in what used to be the normal way. Um, thank you very much, um, David and John, uh, and, and all the best with your ongoing, uh, on, ongoing work.